Well, this was uh, back in uh, 2018, and uh, John had written an a article, uh, and I've looked at it, and we were also, the uh, Red Book for Our Times came out, volume one, in, uh, which is this one, which we're talking about. And uh, so John has the last article in there, uh, and uh, it was called uh, The Post-Human. Uh, and so uh, anyway, I've been writing back and forth, and uh, John had a uh, Kundalini awakening experience uh, early on, and he struggled with it for about 15 years or so. And uh, he wrote about this journey as he was going through trying to get uh, uh, understand, first of all, what it was. Uh, it just caught him by surprise. And it just, the force was just uh, coming out of him. And so he had to figure out a way to uh, throttle that back, uh, so to speak. And he found that uh, resorting to writing poetry and trying to uh, translate what was coming forth from the spirit uh, was his way of communicating with that. And uh, he also said, I, I had done my experience, I would just paint, I would do artwork. And, you know, it's not very good, but it, it was a way to document it. And so uh, what I liked about that is what he's saying is we need to take that energy and focus it and it, it all gets back to something is emerging that's not formed yet. And we have to nurture that form and that's the creative, that's the real creative spirit. We don't know what it is. We want to know what it is, but he allows that to develop. He kind of nurtures it is the way I look at it because there's two, there's two different kinds of creativity. One is just taking an object and saying, well, I'm gonna, you know, make a, a cup holder or something. So that's using existing things. True creativity is something that's unknown yet. And uh, I, we use that in uh, teaching creative leadership, uh, which I did for a number of years. And we were able to form uh, we knew that about creative uh, work and scientists, and we were in the research and development. And so we knew that these things, they were just kind of a little skeleton, just a little, we're not sure what it is yet. And then we, we let it grow. And then people all around would say, oh, that's crap. That's not good. You know, <laughs> they would say, oh, well, that's awful. There's nothing there but we knew to nurture it and let it grow and then eventually it would come up and emerge into its full uh, uh, manifestation. Uh, so that's the essence coming forth and it's manifesting itself in reality or the objective form. And so that's kind of the discussions I've been having with him back and forth over the last couple of years. And, uh, but uh, John also, who's Cindy Curtis? Okay. John also was um, instrument. He's written a, a whole bunch of books, and I would recommend that you uh, take a look at them in terms of uh, just uh, check out John Woodcock. And uh, uh, he's, uh, we'll see if I've got his address here. Uh, I'll have to look it up. So, um, but anyway, he's a fascinating character and he's done some YouTube videos and, uh, but he also has, I'll go ahead and introduce him even though he's not showed up yet. But anyway, he's, uh, he had a, uh, he's got a PhD in consciousness studies, uh, which is he studies consciousness. And uh, he's uh, also, he's a Jungian, a Jungian therapist. And he was in analysis for about 12 years or 20 years, I think. Yeah, he's still 
uh, with a Jungian analyst, but he's he's a Jungian therapist. He's not a Jungian anal analyst. So there's a difference in the two. So, uh, and he also, um, his therapeutic practice is, he calls it psychotherapy with depth. And he also has his, his wife as Anita. They also do couples counseling. And they have a practice in uh, Lily Field, North Southwest in Sydney, Australia. Now, is that right? Uh, I'll ask the love doctor. <laughs> is, uh, is Lily Field just a, a section of uh, Sydney? Uh, you have to turn on your mic. Yes, he's a practicing therapist in Sydney. Yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just I don't didn't... know where it is, but Lilyfield is a suburb of Sydney. Yeah. Yeah, it's north southwest, so I didn't know exactly, but I like the name Lilyfield. So that sounds yeah. sounds very nice and stuff. But uh, anyway, I would encourage if you're interested in a perspective from. Uh, someone who studies uh, consciousness, who is also a Jungian therapist and al has also been uh, analyzed uh, uh, with people here uh, by Jungian analysts. He has a number and his, his whole uh, thing is about, uh, he found his uh, muse through poetry and he says that really uh, poesis or poetry is the way that the soul communicates with us in the way that we can, he's trying to get us to understand what the soul is trying to tell us. And there's a shift in consciousness at a certain point uh, where you can get that message if you uh, obtain that shift in consciousness. And one of his uh, mentors was uh, um, Owen Barfield. I don't know if you know, heard of Owen Barfield. I think Miles has, uh, but he was one of the Inklings. And uh, the Inklings was C.S. Lewis and uh, J.R. Tolkien. I'm sure you've heard of the, these authors. Well, these guys got together and had this club and they would fight back and forth and uh, you know, C.S. Lewis didn't agree with uh, Barfield, and they just had all these little things. But what was interesting is at the end, they blended all their stuff together. <laughs> so uh, it was really an exciting time. And uh, so that was the member of the Inklings Club. So you might check up on that. I'll but, just uh, chime in here that uh, Pastor, Vol Pastor Paul Vanderclay has often referred to Owen Barfield. But the one thing that really struck struck me, and I still remember it to this day and think about it a lot, is Owen Barfield said that poets will save the world. Yeah, Owen. In other uh, words, art and creativity is, as much as we'd like to think, oh, we'll get a big supercomputer going with, collective super intelligence like one person I know is always talking about uh, I think it's no it's just going to be poetry and art and the heart yeah the, the whole idea is that and particularly if you uh, when we talk about uh, Thomas Starks uh, and that's why we're in agreement here is that we've moved so far away from uh, this uh, uh, poetry and poesis and uh, from our soul that we're we've lost contact with it and we're tr we're trying to get these back so uh, anyway I, meanwhile I want to I want to read a very spooky dream of John's which he might not want to refer to when he comes online here okay. comes Mears. yeah I got her okay um, but but uh, it's, it's a spooky dream. You'll see why when I read it. Um, it's, in, it's in his article in Jung's Red Book for Our Time, and that's why we're talking with 
him especially today. Um, and the dream is as follows. Um, a man is among us. He looks quite normal, but he is in fact alien. He is friendly, wants to, needs to live among us and is warmly welcomed. Many therapists are excited and thrilled with the glamour of his gifts, which include spaceships that could fly at dizzying speeds. I join in with this madness for a bit, but lose interest and instead grow increasingly alarmed. I try to warn others. I decide to act. I want to burn him and race around looking for a flamethrower. Instead, I kept grabbing fire extinguishers and spray him with those. They are useless. He tries to stop me, and we seem to realize that there is nothing personal in this. He wants simply to live here, and I could sense incredibly danger, incredible danger to us. I say, it's just that our species can't survive if you stay. We need to survive too. Then I go back to my frantic search. He says, responding to my alarm, do you mean what if I spit on the carpet or people? And he does so, thus at last revealing the danger. A terrible poison was in his spittle. It dissolves flesh, leaving horrible forms, like a fly dissolves its meal. Sound like anything contemporary to you? <laughs> he had that a dream in the 90s. Um, but it, to me, it sounds like... Uh, the, the, the man that is among us is the coronavirus and the young people who aren't afraid of it and the governors who aren't afraid of it and want everything to go back to hunky-dory. Well, and as uh, Thomas Hartz said in his article there, is uh, we're in a period of angst right. uh, without the coronavirus. So now right. we've got angst on top of angst. So, right. <laughs> you know, it's really, uh, it's really coming up. And, uh, Hi, Miritus. Welcome. Uh, Hi, Skip. How, how are everyone? I hope everyone is well. Yes, we're good. Miritus is from uh, Brazil, from Paraiba. Pa Paraiba, right? Paraiba. Paraiba, okay, I got it. Northern Brazil. Yes. How, how far does Sao Paulo from where you live? Um, more than 2,000 kilometers. Uh -huh. I don't know, converting to miles. Yeah, how... It's a long way. It's like from Washington yes. to Denver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, once, I once had a colleague who was the treasurer of my company in Rochester, New York, and he told me one day that I should run over to Tom Curry's office and talk to him about a problem that they were having technically. And I, and Tom Curry was in Singapore. <laughs> and, and so, and I was in Tokyo and I said, do you realize that Tom is as far from me as, as uh, you are from Hamburg, West Germany? <laughs> He didn't realize that, but anyway, sometimes we're quite parochial in the United States. <laughs> um, so do you want to send uh, John an email and just make sure he remembers? Try I did. On. You did, okay. Yeah, good. I just did, so we'll, right. we'll see. So I guess we should just continue with the uh, some of the time it starts. Uh, yeah, well, unless uh, anybody's got any questions about what I just said about Woodcock and uh, Owen Barfield, and there's such a wealth of information. Uh, so, um, I, w I was sort of distracted by my problem on the on the YouTube drum, so. What you're saying is that, that for John, poetry opens up the mystery 
of the unconscious. Is that the gist of what you were saying? No, I was saying that it did for him. It did for him, right. Yeah, in other words, individually, you have to figure out what it is that will uh, open it up for you. In my case, it was doing artwork. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though it was not, I'm not an artist, I'm just doing art, you know. <laughs> just Well, you did that, that lovely table that you had showed us. Once. Yeah, I do. I do woodworking and uh, working with the hands and getting the, it, I think it goes back to touching. You need to touch something. Uh, at least I do, uh, you know, but other people, you need to decide what will work uh, for you best. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to try to make whatever's coming up conscious is the idea because it's a, a message for you and you can do it through your dreams. Uh, you can do it, uh, you know, there's various methods. So each person, it's up to you. As Young said, you need to find your myth, your individual myth. And Young uh, said, I've all, always said in the Red Book, that's his myth. However, it was the architectural structure of the coming times. And this is what the whole, uh, uh, you know, searching for the soul under postmodern conditions. Uh, he had hints of what he was doing, of what was coming. And what yeah. was to come. And yeah. but it's not fully developed and it's up to us uh, to develop it. Uh, in terms of uh, searching for our particular uh, myth. He said, we, we need a big central myth uh, from a uh, uh, concept of the collective. Sure. So I, um, I'm always troubled by the use of the term myth. Okay, we need a symbol. How's that? Well, um, a, uniting, a uniting symbol of some sort. Okay, forms. so so let empty. me explain why it, it I'm you, troubled uh, by that word. Okay, all right. Okay, yeah. so I'm troubled by that word because in the at least American English vernacular, uh, the word myth means a story that is not me, not here, not now, not true, and. Um, and so when we use that word, you know, people who have been raised on the, in the rational world, in, the, in total rationality, um, tend to think that and tend to think we're talking about, about, you know, voodoo or something like that. And I, I don't know what I, what I'm, trying to explain is that what Jung discovered in the Red Book period was the way the psyche actually works as opposed to the rational approach which is is statistics oriented and so it's rational uh, but you know it can miss the mark it can miss the mark by a, by a mile but um, <coughs> but what Jung explicated, which does come through in poetry and art, is how the psyche actually communicates with us, okay, in the sense that um, if we were, I mean, all of us probably have had this reflex of feeling like we're falling out of bed and, and just jumping, okay, well, that reflex comes from a time when our ancestors here's john yeah here's were, john we're living in trees and and so we needed that reflex in order to um in order to survive and our our ancestors sur survived because we didn't fall out of trees when we were sleeping <laughs> literally hello john and welcome um we're we're just uh I'm going to unmute you. Uh, uh, there you are. We can hear you. Uh, are you able to activate yeah. a video? 
Ah, there, there you are. There he is. Welcome. So I'm going to pass the torch to Jerome. I was I was just uh, marking time while we waited for John to arrive. So. <gasps> Hey, John, this is Jerome, and uh, I was, uh, he put his earplugs in so he can hear me. Anyway, this is Jerome, and we've, I have the wrong, uh, <laughs> yeah, Paul, didn't yeah okay. we've had uh, a lot of email conversations, but we've never seen each other's, uh, well, you haven't seen my face, but I've seen your face, <laughs> you know, in this virtual, in this virtual, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, good, good, everybody here? Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, I've already introduced you to the panel here and you may know some of the panel like, uh, Skiff and, uh, Nancy Poff, I think, and the love doctor, uh, Nicole. Yes. Uh, and, uh, so we have, you're among some people here. And, uh, anyway, uh, what I was introducing you is, uh, that you're a practicing uh, psychotherapist from Lilyfield in Sydney, Australia, Australia. And John has a PhD in consciousness studies and he's a Jungian therapist and he likes to practice psychotherapy in depth. And he's had over 30 years experience in studying and researching about psychology, 12 years of personal analysis. And uh, he's written a number of books that I would encourage people to take a look at his website on John Woodcock. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you know, we're uh, particularly, uh, you wrote the uh, last, uh, in the first volume one of the Red Book for Our Time, you wrote the last article uh, the post Cuban and, uh, we also were talking about Thomas arts, uh, who just passed and, uh, what, uh, the significance of this, uh, the red book, uh, for our times and his, his contribution in getting that book going. And, uh, we would, uh, appreciate it you know if you could uh, give us some comments uh, that you have about thomas uh, i know uh, thomas uh, i had uh, we had some emails and he had suggested that i do a red book uh, and he was uh, he came up with a leather copy of a red book a yeah, blank yeah. copy called the blank red yeah. book and he was yeah. going to get that done for us and so i wanted one skiff wanted one uh, but I don't know what's going to happen to it. But uh, what's interesting is John is the one that uh, uh, interested me. He, when we were uh, communicating back and forth, he said, well, what is your biographical spiritual journey? Have you done that? And I said, well, no. And so you got me thinking and I said, okay, I'm going to get all my paintings and collective and and all my writings, my experiences, and we've discussed some of them that I've had because they're very similar uh, to your experiences in terms of, uh, you know, our Kundalini awakening uh, segments and so forth. But uh, anyway, I'll introduce you. Here's John. <laughs> so. Thanks, Jerome. It's good, it's good to see you uh, more or less in person <laughs> through the video. Yeah. And uh, Sk Skip, we, we met before, of course, and uh, uh, you did your, your marvelous in your video series. And uh, I know Nicole from another connection through academia, right? <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, 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 with my connection with Thomas uh, uh, I, I, um, happened, uh, I think it was 2015. Um, see, uh, as you know, I, I live out in Australia, as does, does Nicole. And um, so for, for years, I've just been carrying on my work uh, uh, and, and writing and uh, without any expectation of publication. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, I did the usual thing of writing and and sending stuff to, pub to publications uh, and uh, journals and so on. 
and pretty soon you 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 build a drawer a drawer full of uh, reject notices, <laughs> and uh, after after a time, I think most writers know this experience. After a time, you just you don't want to fill up your drawer with any more rejection slips. <laughs> So you just keep writing. I just kept writing, as a, and um, out of the blue, uh, Thomas uh, emailed me around 2015, said he was putting a book together. Uh, it was in German, and I, I don't know German, <clears throat> but um, he was writing something on. He, he was putting a, a book together on 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 the on the Red Book, and he wanted me to be in it. And I was totally surprised by that invitation. And uh, uh, but we had a, a very nice conversation, and uh, it so happened I had a a piece that I put in an essay form, and I just had to expand it a bit and edit. And I had a a entry for his book. It's, it's called the Hidden Legacy of C. G. Jung, uh, or the Hidden Legacy of the Red Book. I think I I can't remember which. Yeah, the Hidden Hidden Legacy of the Red Book. And uh, so I sent that to him and he liked it enough that uh, we included it in his book. And um, does anyone want to know what the hidden legacy of the Red Book is? Okay, tell us the secret. I would, I would love to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to hear, hear that, that okay. explicated. Because it's hidden. <laughs> it's, it's hidden in the Red Book. And uh, uh, nobody else has noticed it. Uh, it. It's not so much hidden content. It, it's it's the hidden style. <clears throat> it's in it's in the literary genre in which he's writing. <clears throat> and uh, I uh, once I noticed it in one particular passage, I started noticing it everywhere. And uh, I don't even know if Jung knew it. But uh, uh, all the commentators I've read on the Red Book do not point it out. Uh, but I think it's I think it's it's a critical advance in culture, as as, as well as everything else about the book is a critical advance in culture. But this particular it, it, this particular advance is a literary advance uh, that that's uh, uh, connected to uh, a new style of consciousness. And um, and other other people in the world are sort of trying to uh, are moving towards it too in their own way. So you know, obviously, I did a lot of research into genres of literature uh, throughout the world, and um, uh, the the best the best um, author I've come across recently is Murakami, a Japanese author. And uh, he seems to be writing in a style very similar to the Red Book. And uh, but the 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 style is um, uh, in the essay. I, I compared uh, what Jung was doing with what Alice in Wonderland was doing. So she goes down the rabbit hole, and she leaves the real world behind, or or, or the waking world behind. She, in the story, she actually falls asleep, but. In her experience, she goes down the rabbit hole, and uh, uh, she engages the, uh, the the inhabitants of Wonderland, as Jung did, completely in their terms. Uh, uh, not quite as Jung did, but she 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 took them as real in as real way as Jung did that part, and so. Um, uh, then she goes through the whole story, engaging the caterpillar, the mad hatter, the white rabbit, and so on. And she just takes them on in their own terms while remaining a little girl. Uh, but she's, uh, also, she's also a part of that wonderland now because she can grow and she can shrink and all of that. Uh, but when she... So she's in a kind of fictional consciousness. And when she... The way she gets out of that... Uh, is right at the very end when uh, the Red Queen threatens her and she says, oh, you're all just a pack of cards. And that's when she pulls out of Wonderland back into waking reality. She wakes up. So, so that moment, 
you can see that's a completely different characterization of Wonderland. To say you're all just a pack of cards, that's simply an empirical observation. That means she's put, she's no longer, those cards are not walking uh, knaves and knights and so on. And they're just a pack of cards. That's, an, that's, that's a, an empirical observation of the world that uh, where things are just things. When she's in Wonderland, as one of them, uh, they're alive. They talk to her, just like in the Red Book. They instruct her. And the, 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 way, the way to get out of that is by moving into empirical reality and seeing things from that point of view, which is always from the outside. So from the outside, they just become a pack of cards. And that simply means she's, she wakes up. Now, the interesting thing, does, it, does that make sense? Or do you want me to go into that a bit more? Because to get, to get the comparison, I have to, uh, you have to sort of get that piece about out, the different styles of consciousness. It's, it's like being in a dream and you're talking away to the, the other dream characters. You're just one, one in that dream world. And then on waking up, you say, well, what a dream that was. See, that, yeah, that language that language belongs to empirical reality. You're now seeing the dream from the outside, which means you've woken up to our ordinary state of consciousness. You're no longer in it. John, would you uh, think that that is like what the novelist or playwright is trying to get back to when uh, they feel like they have writer's block that a novelist is kind I of do. in that yeah. novelist is I kind do. of in that state yes i, I certainly do in right. fact uh, in the in the early 20th century the uh and the 19th century there was a huge enthusiasm uh in in, in, in literature about finding their way back to the hypnagogic state because that's where the action happened uh, um, Edgar Allan Poe was a great exponent of that. He, want, he used alcohol. He wanted to get back into the hypnagogic state because that's when everything comes alive and, and you get spoken to, you get addressed. So that, that, that's exactly right. And writer's block, I think some forms of writer's block, at least the ones I've had, I just can't get back into it. And right. It's the same with dreams. Sometimes I have a dream and I, and I, and I try to re-enter it in waking life and I just can't get there so it's just it could might as well be somebody else's dream mm -hmm. oh there's Nancy too I just saw you there Nancy good to see you yeah. right. uh, so so if we're clear about Alice's journey it's about her becoming fictional like the rest of the other characters and then pulling out in, into our waking state of consciousness by that statement you're just a pack of cards that's, that's the language that belongs to the outside looking at things. So once you get that, then you can go back to the Red Book and find the hidden legacy. Because the very interesting thing is, if you look at, if you look at the Red Book carefully at, at the actual uh, dialogues, the rhetoric, what you'll see is something that I haven't seen before. And that is, there's no doubt that Jung engages with the, with the fictional characters or the psychic reality uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. You know, he gets taught by Philemon and so on. And uh, uh, he, he's fully engaged, but he brings his empirical consciousness along with him. He does not leave it behind. Now that's new. That's a, that's a new, that's a new state of consciousness where he enters fictional reality in his empirical question, empirical consciousness. Would that be like a shaman does? He has one foot in reality and the other in the other world. And he keeps that, uh, uh, you know, he has to keep that distance as he goes through. Uh, he, he's in one hypnagogic state that he's creating for the, people but he also has to keep grounded uh, in the in the normal reality is that similar to uh, that? could could be jerome i haven't i haven't uh i, I haven't uh, had the time really to do comparative research on that on that particular point but one thing i'm absolutely convinced of 
is that what Jung did is new, and that it hasn't been picked up. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't been explored. That that he's he's actually producing a uh, a new form of literature that reflects a different style of consciousness. One where the difference between empirical reality and dream reality start to come together. Oh, I now see. So you're saying that's, that's merging. That's merging together. I, I, don't, I don't know if merging is the right word. Um, okay. Uh, you said penetrating at one point. Is, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with language too because because it has its own language. See, this is a new style of consciousness, and as soon as you uh, try to understand it from other points, other kinds of consciousness, you lose it. Yeah. It, need, it, needs, to, it needs to spell itself out for us. <laughs> then we'll get it. Uh, but um, uh, another example I give in that essay is uh, when I compare him to uh, Charles Williams' work. So do you know Charles Williams' works at all? He, 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 he uh, he, d he does amazing work on the interpenetration of uh, spiritual reality and ordinary reality in his books, like uh, um, uh, what are some of his novels? Um, the Place of the Lion is a famous one, Charles could Williams. You, could you repeat that? The Place? The Place of the Lion. Oh, okay. And that's, that's where he, it's, it's a story of where Plato's forms break into ordinary reality with all their power and luminosity and, and uh, then the adventure starts. <laughs> wow. Wow. Nobody, nobody was quite prepared for that. Well, just you as know, you're, that, that's a, as you're talking, there's uh, when I have to get this at the right distance from my camera in order for it to not be uh -huh. ephemeral. Uh, okay. This is, this is an Inuit image of a shaman. And the shaman, it's a whalebone carving. The shaman is looking both out and inward. Okay, so here it is. Mm. And this is, this is from uh, Donald Kalshid's Trauma and the Soul. And the soul. Right. 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 Um, right. So that's what, uh, what, uh, Jerome was talking about as yes. far <clears throat> right, right. What was the name of that book, John? By, Ch it's by Charles Williams. Yes. Uh, uh, the space of the place of the lion. L i o n. Oh, L i o. Thank you. The yeah, place of the lion, and and then you then you'll uh, th then you'll get hold of his other books uh, very easily if you get that one. Uh, they all they all speak to uh, the same point of, of what happens when spiritual reality breaks into ordinary reality, which is not it's not quite the same as what Jung is doing. But that's where I want to make some pretty fine distinctions to get to get the uh, the complete newness of this legacy. It's a new form of consciousness. It hasn't been around before. That's my point. What are you showing us there, Cindy? Cindy, what were you showing us? What? That's the book? Uh-huh. Oh, oh, she's got it on a screen there. Yeah. yeah. Cindy, Cindy. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. Uh, so we were discussing that uh, Young always uh, said that uh, he kind of only touched the surface of seeing what was emerging uh and that the story is not complete and it kind of sounds like you're saying this is has come a little bit further in our since that time is that correct uh, I, I was talking before you came on about uh, i used to teach uh, creativity to leaders and uh, research scientists and what we would do we would birth uh, something from the subconscious creativity which is it's the imaginal realm, not the imagination realm. The imaginal realm is something forms and it's very, it's like an embryo and it's unformed. And we teach the research scientists to hold on to that and just birth that as it emerges uh, until it comes into uh, reality. 
uh, and that's the way that uh, a true uh, uh, what I would call uh, ideas that haven't formed yet uh, have have been, uh, been created, and we teach that to uh, to to utilize that form of uh, 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 in in terms of coming up with some new ideas uh, that haven't been done before. Right. Shall I continue my story of Charles Williams and the difference yes, please. between him yeah. and, and, and uh, Jung? Now, now, Charles Williams, uh, in, in his book, The Place of the Lion, uh, describes an episode exquisitely uh, uh, of a woman uh, who uh, was interpenetrated with, uh, by, by the platonic form of a serpent. You know, very powerful, very numinous, and uh, they they merge. They they, they uh, the story the, the, the chapter shows her slowly becoming the snake, uh, and, and she uh, she becomes less human. She come, becomes more snake until the snake is becomes totally visible. That that's the platonic form, and uh, so that that's I describe that very very carefully. And then I compare that to Jung when he was wrapped in the serpent. Right? They, they, they might seem very close, just descript, two descriptions of the same phenomenon, but they're totally different. Uh, Jung describes his experience of being wrapped by the serpent in the Red Book, but the difference is he is in his, uh, just to back up a bit, when Charles Williams wrote that, there's nothing in that story about from Charles Williams saying this is happening to me. You know, it's happening to a character in his book. But Jung is writing down, he's recording what's happening to him. Now, that can't be explained easily. He, didn't, he doesn't have a real snake wrapping around him, but he has an imaginal snake, which is just as real, wrapping around him. <laughs> And he's trying to write it down at the same time, so he's awake. He, that, that the, he's in, in his empirical reality, he's, he's still in this imaginal space, and it's really happening to him. That's what. That's where we need new language, and that's that's what I think is is being is not being seen terribly well when people read the Red Book. Uh, one final example might uh, bring it home a little bit. Imagine an author. Uh, writing a story about uh, going to an island and being invited to a feast of cannibalism. So he 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 records uh, he record or he records a fictional story. I'm sorry, he records records a fictional story of, of cannibalism where where people eat another person. So, so there's nothing there about the author being a cannibal. He's just made, he's just writing a very interesting graphic story. In the Red Book, there, there's a, an episode where Jung uh, uh, can, cannibalizes a little girl's liver. Now, that's not Jung telling us fictionally what it would be like to cannibalize a little girl. He's saying he was forced to do it in his waking consciousness to eat them. And there's no, you know, from one, there's no little girl, <laughs> but there is. It's this imaginal reality that's become so real that he tells us how revolted he was and how much he was in a sweat and how he couldn't do it. And yet he was, uh, this mysterious woman ordered him to eat the liver, of, the liver of this dead little girl. And so he did, but it's his waking consciousness that's, that's uh, being affected by it. He, he's, he's being revolted, he wants to throw it up, but it, it's happening to him in his waking consciousness in imaginal space. That's new. So there's, there's three examples <laughs> that, I, that I, I give in my essay, uh, Alice, Charles Williams, and, and, uh, and then the cannibalism episode. Interesting. It, 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 there's, there's, there's a new consciousness there, and uh, it hasn't been named, and it's just, it's ju it's just a germ of a new consciousness. And uh, and I, that's why I call it the hidden legacy. It, it's a new, it, it's something happening in the deep psyche that wants that change. And Jung was a mouthpiece for it. I don't know whether he knew it, 
Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it seems like subsequent commentators on the Red Book are not picking it up or not, are not interested in it for some reason. But for me, it's central. It's central to uh, uh, his legacy to future generations. He, he found his way to that form of consciousness and, and uh, wrote it down. So yeah, he, he, his, his Red Book is a, uh, a record. It's not, it's not a fictional account of something. It's, it's a record of what was happening to him awake. Yeah, yeah. Purely imaginal at the same time. Yeah, yeah, well, was a pioneer, and usually the pioneers, uh, uh, you know, they're the, you know, they set the, the pace and so forth, and they don't realize what they're doing sometimes. Exactly. Your stories, exactly. your, your, your stories also remind me of some dream work where uh, you approach a dream, you can be outside the dream, or they suggest you dive in and become part of the dream. So, I mean, it it kind of, it kind of, uh, that's what what my association was, but I don't know if that's related to it or not. But it kind of sounds like uh... so. So, John, I had an experience uh, in 1993, um, which emerged as a novel, um, and it took eight months. And during that period, I. I call it the autobiography of my enema um, because I had a I had eight years in Japan but five years in business in Japan that were extremely intense in various ways and um, so in 1993 I was moved for various reasons to write a novel and I decided to write a novel about the first woman prime minister of Japan from the time she was 15 uh, and sold to the Yakuza to uh, pay a debt by her father uh, until the time she's seven, 75 and retired prime minister of Japan. And so it's called Meiko, Memoir of a Woman. But in that, experience, uh, I was definitely in that space, okay? But I believe I was in that space as my anima, okay? And everything in it is true. I mean, everything that is said in that novel, I can vouch for as either being my direct experience or being uh, something that happened to somebody uh, who I know intimately. And so um, so I wrote this novel. It includes certain pornographic parts to it. And uh, I put it in my drawer for 21 years. Um, and I was, I mean, I really felt, but I, I had been in it. And each morning, you know, a vision of, the chief character would wake me up in the morning at 6 a.m. and would insist that I go to my computer and with the lights turned very low and my screen turned very uh, pale so that I almost couldn't see it, um, I put my hands on the, the keys and this novel wrote itself. And, um, it was sort of, and I didn't have the benefit of any psychological training at that time, really. Um, I had read uh, Man and His Symbols before then, and uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves, um, and I had studied MBTI, but, um, but I mean, this was a real experience that happened to me. I could not stop writing this book every day until I'd written 500 to 1,000 words, and then it was done for the day, and I could go on with my life. Uh, and so I'd be finished by 8 or 9 in the morning, but then the next morning at 6 a.m., this psychogenic vision would wake me up. And so I remember when the Red Book came out, it was a huge relief to me <laughs> because... I, I 
saw that and I said, wow, if that could happen to uh, the one of the most famous psychologists, psychiatrists of the 20th century, then I'm, maybe I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so I, I just wonder if you have any comment on that. Well, it, it's uh, it, it sounds like a, a, a really an incredibly powerful and rich experience that'll stay with you for the rest of your life. Surely, uh, yeah. Uh, Skip um, the uh, in in drawing comparisons. Uh, that's uh, that's certainly a, a kind of an inquiry uh, that's necessary in order to make the distinctions between uh, um, aspects of the inner world. You might say that that you know we all have we, we have our uh, uh, inner experiences, and then when we talk to others, uh, we start to compare our experiences, and that's really worthwhile um, uh, to do. But but the uh, uh, it, it's it's also important for me to to just stay with uh, what Jung was doing in the Red Book and try and get it in its own terms without any comparisons. It's more like an imminent critique where where you critique it in terms of its in terms of, in, in its own terms, and uh, that's that's where. Um, I can start to get a sense of uh, what might be trying to happen uh, in the in the writing itself. Right. So one of the things uh, you might want to compare your experience with his uh, would be along these lines, uh, and and my critique that if if he is if he is indeed entering a a, a new kind of consciousness. That, that the that the book is is reflecting, uh, and uh, I'm talking about an intimate relationship between language and consciousness. All right, if there's a new style of consciousness, then the the language would reflect it, and it and it it, it can't be translated into other terms that belong to other style of consciousness. Now, so what? Uh, what what happens when uh, we actually encounter a new style of consciousness that's wanting to come into being from the deep psyche? What happens to us? Well, there, there's also a very intimate relationship between style of consciousness and the way the world appears to us. And I go into that in my some of my other books when I talk about the evolution of consciousness. That, uh, when uh, when we're in different styles of consciousness. Uh, in past eras, the world appeared very differently. There's, there's a big connection between the two. Uh, the way the world appears and the, and the style of consciousness that we're in are very intimately connected. So if Jung entered a new style of consciousness, in, uh, as reflected in the, in the rhetoric of the Red Book, how would the world appear? How would the world begin to appear to someone in that state of mind? That's the question. That 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 to me is the living question. Well, one thing I was how, saying how, be, sorry, before yeah, before you joined us just now, I uh, was saying, and I'd like you to comment. I was saying that what Jung discovered was the way the psyche actually works, as opposed to the rational statistical approach that is the the Freudian type of approach uh, to the psyche. Uh, and I have enough experience with statistics to know that there are lots of black swans around, as our president <laughs> is currently learning. Um, and I know that there are black swans in Australia, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, uh, it seems to me that what he did by his Red Book experience was actually experience how the psyche really communicates with us, as opposed to um, having some theory about it and, okay, you have this symptom and then we can give you this pill and everything's going to be hunky-dory type thing. 
I just wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, I absolutely agree. I mean, uh, in, in his old age, um, occasionally, apparently, he would burst out in, in, into um, um, some kind of um, despair that nobody understood what he was talking about when he talked about the reality of the psyche. See, and that's as an old man. Right. Uh, so there was all this talk about the psyche, but 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 he see to be to uh, to, to to get the the reality of the psyche, the word reality is critical. And so how do we how do we come to an experience a different kind of reality, which is another way of saying how do we enter a state where the world appears to us differently. And so it's not just ideas about the world, it's where you actually, everything in your being responds to a different appearance of the world. Now there's only one way that that happens and that's through initiation. You have to be initiated into another reality. This is, this is where initiations um, are so important, they were, uh, that the initiates, like the shaman, he wasn't just told about another world, he was initiated into it. And the, the stories that, are, that we have that are faint echoes of that mystery, you know, for example, like the dismemberment of the shaman or, 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 or the shaman becoming a skeleton and being taught things by the dead or, 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 or diving into a pond and being taught by the snake masters, all of that all of those are stories that are faint echoes of an initiatory practice where you actually become something different. And so, so to, end, to, to experience the reality of the psyche, you have to be initiated. So what, what does the initiating in that regard? Well, it's the psyche, the psyche itself does. It's where, it's where the psyche uh, uh, gives you an experience that is as real and as, as convincing as kicking a rock, as Johnson said. Uh, it, it, it has the same immediacy and presence as, wake, as, as the things of the waking world do, you know, when you hit a, kick a rock. That, I mean, that's incontrovertible. Nobody, nobody's going to say that rock's a dream or, you know, you could, yeah, I, got, I got bruised by the rock. It's real. So in other words, an initiation, in order for it to become other realities to become as real as waking reality, you have to have an initiation, and that initiation has to involve the body, like kicking a rock. So you have to have another bodily experience that is as real as that, but not collapsible to that. You can't say, oh, that was just a strange waking experience. No, you're actually in another, in another world we that you're that you're initiated into and this is what the red book is all about he was initiated into another world where that world became as real but not collapsible to waking life that's that's what he called the psyche the reality of the psyche so he's that's why he has these experiences of, of cannibalizing the little girl's liver or, or or having the snake wrap itself around him while, and, and then going to the cross He's not imagining this. He's not having a meditation. It's happening to him, uh, and it, with the same kind of reality to it as waking reality. That's where he gets. That's where he. That's the initiation for Jung into the reality of the psyche, and that's why he almost went to his grave in despair that nobody got what he was saying. That's how new it is. Is is that akin to lucid dreaming? Uh, close. So, sorry, Jerome. Is that akin to lucid dreaming? Um, I'm just trying to get some associations here. Yeah, and I don't think that'll work. Okay. Uh, it, we'll, it, we'll it's, uh, because tear that because when we when we try to do that, we're trying to use uh, language that doesn't belong to the experience. Okay. Uh, in sure. other words, uh, language the language of the Red Bull is, uh, as you know, if you, you know, I'm assuming everyone's read the Red Book, it, the translators and the editors go to an enormous amount of trouble talking about the language. Yeah. You know? Right. 
and oh. um, they, they call it polyphonic language. And, and, and thank God they did that. Thank God they didn't try and sort it out and try and reduce it back to categories that we all know about because that language, as confusing as it is, I think there's about three or four registers of language in the book. And it, it's, an, it's a new language trying to come to be that is associated with a new appearance of the world. And Jung got there. Jung got there, and that—that's—he was terribly alone with it. Um, so, so he—he—he he, he had experiences that he tells some of the experiences he tells us in memories, dreams, and reflections. Uh, now, you could sort of look at those experiences and say, "Well, isn't that like this? And isn't it like that?" The answer is no. This is new. And uh, so, so when 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 uh, Richard Wilhelm died and simultaneously he appeared at the foot of Jung's bed at night and they had a conversation. And, and Wil Wilhelm uh, was, was dressed in an ancient Chinese uh, oh. garment. Oh. Uh, Jung, absolutely, you could not say to Jung, did you dream that? Did you have a lucid dream? Uh, were you awake? The, the fact, the only way he could say it is that Richard Wilhelm appeared to me at the foot of the bed. That's the new appearance. He doesn't want to break that into, that was an inner experience or an outer experience. He wants to say simply, Wilhelm appeared at my bed. And Jung had so many experiences like that. You know, we just get faint hints of it from his memories, dreams and reflections or his other writings. He, he hid it all. And this, this is where um, uh, Catafalque, uh, Kingsley's book, Catafalque, is so helpful because he's onto that. He's onto the, who Jung was mm -hmm. and how, what incredible lengths he went to to hide it because he was born into a world of science and he absolutely knew that if he started coming out with this stuff saying, well, you know, last night I had a visit from so-and-so and, and, you know, the so-and-so has <laughs> been dead dead for 200 years where we had a great conversation and Phil Philemon and I wandered around in the backyard of my, of my house at Kuznak and he taught me things, you know, and I listened carefully. He's not going to get much of a hearing. Now that, that's the problem uh, uh, in, in our modern life, that, that if you have strange experiences like that, uh, you're not going to get much of a hearing. So he, he just almost tore himself in half by, by uh, covering it all up and trying to be a scientist. But when, when you hear him say, you know, everything is imp I'm doing is empirical, he's using that word empirical in a, in a new way. <laughs> and people just aren't getting that. You know, Experiential uh, he, empiricism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, his, his empiricism cannot be verified by another party. You know, it's, it's all, uh, but that's what makes his writing so alive because he, he describes it phenomenologically and that's, that's the right way to go. And and uh, but he calls that empirical. So it's, it's a, he's trying to work with language, as I've been trying to point out here, in a totally new way. And all we've got to create new language is is the familiar language, but we want to pour new meaning into that language. Uh, and that that's how culture has always advanced. By uh, like Jesus, for example, with his parables. When he was saying, you take the wheat and you, and some of it falls on the ground and some of it falls in the fields. He's not talking about wheat. You know, he's trying to pour new meaning in, into, uh, into the language, but he had to start with the language that everybody knew about, you know, agriculture. But he was, right. he was talking about inner states. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that, that's how, that's how we advance culturally. So Jung was doing the same thing throughout his life, uh, and trying to be a scientist and be accepted as a scientist when he was talking basically as a mystic who's saying this is what happened to me and I don't want to break it up into inner or outer. That's the scientific paradigm. And so that's how the world appeared to him in a new way when he gave up trying to split things into the inner or outer and, and just uh, take, them, take, them at the, uh, take them on their own terms and that's where this other world could make itself visible to him. Right. Uh, John, this seems to me like 
Hey, Tim. Uh, yeah. It's, it seems to me like oh, the kind of, uh, no, Tim, sorry. Tim, yeah. <laughs> seems to me that like the kind of language we hear about the indigenous shamans and, and their experiences of bringing the other world into our experience. Would you say that that's similar or is that a different thing? I'd say I would need to be very cautious. Uh, I, I have tremendous respect for the for the, uh, the indigenous peoples and their experience. I know that when they talk about the dream time, they're not talking about dreams in the way we talk about dreams. They're, they're talking they're talking about a ground um, that they can go to and live in. Um, now. Where, where I feel cautious is that uh, our, modern, our, mo our modern time, things are a bit more precarious because we have this thing called the ego, the waking ego. And it's, it's a very hardened little ego, hardened with its habits of thought. And um, uh, the uh, previous times, previous ages, they did not have that hardened ego. So, so when, you know, if we're looking at the oral tradition or the written tradition, when they're writing down their experiences or, or telling them through the oral tradition, their starting point is just so far different from ours that uh, to draw to draw two easy comparisons, I think would do a great disservice to them and, and their wisdom. Uh, the um, uh, we have this waking ego that's that's divided from the rest of our being. And we're in a lot of trouble because of it. <laughs> uh, and uh, as more and more people are noticing, uh, you, you know, they call it the Cartesian e ego or the separate self or, or whatever, however you want to say it. But it, it, uh, Jung, Jung understood it as a dissociation um, in our culture. Uh, we've, got, we've got to work with that. And that's tough. And, and so he, you know, you know, how did he, how did he, how did he have to deal with that dissociation, which he carried too? And, and that's, that was through having the horrible experiences of the Red Book. If you, uh, if you look carefully at the Red Book, you'll see it's full of torture. He went through torture. Uh, now, Dan, he covered it up, but I've uncovered it. Uh, the key term to look for in understanding Jung's uh, experience uh, as captured in the Red Book is to look for the term suspension. And he describes it uh, in, in a wonderful, free-flowing, thoughtful way uh, in, 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 in the book, uh, the Zarathustra lectures, the Zarathustra seminars. He goes into the the idea of suspension very deeply, and you know, in, he must have, it must have been incredible to be in the room because he had just imaginal explosion of <laughs> thoughts and images. He just let go. He was talking about one thing in the in the seminars, and then suddenly suspension, and away he went. But and I've listed that uh, in, in that essay in my essay there. Uh, uh, listed all the things he said about suspension. And there you'll see images of torture, uh, torment, uh, the closest to which uh, the imagery, the closest, the closest of all of that is, is in the Zosimos uh, um, uh, experiences that Jung also talks about in Answer to Job. Uh, he talks about the Zosimos um, visions. Yeah, Vision of Zosimos, Z O S I M O S. If you're not familiar, yes, those um, are those are incredibly graphic. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's what Jung went through. Now right, it's right. hard to grasp that uh, if you haven't been there, but uh, that cannot be assimilated back into any other categories of thought. You have to take it in its own terms. And uh, uh, so he's referring to Zosimos for a very good reason because that's what Jung went through in the Red Bull. Yeah, and that, it's uh, something. It's something like uh, the Book of Revelation in the Bible, is it not? 
Well, tell me more. How, how are you thinking about that? I, I, well, I haven't I'm, made that comparison. Well, there's, uh, I mean, John of Patmos was describing a revelation to himself and, you know, Christianity has taken it as a, as a <clears throat> revelation that happened to everyone, but it was a vision and it was an extremely um, vivid vision and and very bloody in some parts. I mean, um, the the creatures that he saw and, um, you know, the seven seals and all of that and, and the visioning of, of uh, you know, Mother Mary and so on, um, and, you know, eating the, ch the children and such. I mean, it's a if you, if you read the, if you read Revelation, it's a pretty uh, yeah. bloody mess. And, I, and it, I take it as the vision of one man and going through Christ yeah, and Christianity takes it as a as a prophecy of of what all humanity is going to do, and we keep trying to live it. Okay, it, fundamentalist Christians keep trying to live it, so they they're all for everybody getting killed except the last two thousand and so on, like that. Yeah, except for themselves. Yeah, they they wouldn't want to go through that. Um, yeah, but, uh, and so 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 the uh, in terms of hermeneutics. Uh, that is a useful example, as is Zosimos, uh, which particularly attracted Jung, because he was trying to understand his own experiences by studying those those documents hermeneutically. Yeah, he he was uh, he was looking for experiences that could relate to his own during the Red Book, and of course he turned to alchemy because uh, right. they're, they're full of. Uh, experiences of torture and dismemberment and uh, being twisted up and tormented. Uh, but that's what he went through in the Red Book. Uh, the Red Book records that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, uh, has, uh, in my experience, it hasn't been picked up terribly much in the secondary literature, that this, this a motif of torture. But that, if you read his biographies, uh, you can read between the lines. You, you can sort of, for example, there's one example that some have quoted where he says that in order to stabilize himself while he was going, while he was recording the Red Book, he had to grip the side of the desk with his hands to stop himself coming apart. Now, that's a, that's a guy who's awake. Yes. He's, not, he's not asleep. He, he's having to grip the desk and for a while, he engaged in yogic practices to calm himself down. This is while he was being inundated by these visions. And uh, so that's where waking reality and imaginal reality are, are in a new configuration. And I'm, I'm reluctant to, to describe it in old categories. I'm, I'm saying it's a new configuration that broke open, open, open for him a new appearance of the world. And it's one he lived with alone for his entire life. Right. So that that, that was his uh, despair. Uh, <laughs> so when life. when you refer to your essay, you're referring to the essay which is in the book with Thomas Ars, not the Thomas, red book yes. for our time. Yeah, the the, the other one is is a carry on from that. I see. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's a okay. follow on. Now, and recently you yeah go ahead, sorry. Recently, you did a an essay on the coronavirus, and I wonder if you'd talk with us about that for a bit, because that's part of our purpose in having these regular meetings. Yeah, can you uh, I just have to before come Before you do that, that just, yeah. just one quick question before we change topics. Um, sure. Just, this is far-fetched, but, you know, we only live in a certain wavelength of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and we only see the visible light spectrum. So anyway, um, do you have any far, uh, far flung ideas that, that there is, a, there is a, another reality that could be around us that we just don't see? Well, they're not really far flung ideas, Miles. The, 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 that springs directly uh, of what we've been talking about that the answer is quite simply yes, and, and Jung found his way through to it uh, by, by initiation. 
and uh, uh, and that's that. It's uh, but you can only get there through initiation. And he describes it exactly how how you describe something around us in which we're embedded, and it, it's there all the time. And uh, the un uh, when when the when the Aboriginals talk about the dream time, they're talking about the same thing, except. They don't have this little ego that shut the door on it. And Jung, because he was born in our time, he had shut the door on it. And that's why there's, there's Jung before the Red Book and Jung after the Red Book that everyone talks about. Uh, uh, that uh, he, uh, he was undone by these experiences because, and they were violent and they were tortured and they were agonizing for him for a couple of years uh, where he didn't know whether he'd survive, uh, but he went through it and thus became initiated. And that's what Peter Kingsley talks about in Catapult. He, he's, right, he's, right he's right on the money with this one, that uh, uh, he, he knows where Jung went. It was into the volcano, the crater. And, and uh, not a pleasant experience. So, uh, and that crater was also the Holy Grail. So they're one and the same. So, so uh, P uh, Peter Kingsley got, gets all that. Uh, but that's the reality that surrounds us at all times and out of which we were born as, as a separate ego. And, and finding, finding our way back requires an initiation. But it's an initiation that has to undo a separate ego and that's that's a violent affair i mean some people are softer about it i, I, I think particularly women may be softer in it uh, that it doesn't have to be as violent but um our our history as reflected in our consciousness is is, is that we have to be undone fairly violently by it in order to loosen up the ego and soften it and, and to make it available for access to this bigger world isn't that going to be what the coronavirus does for us? Well, uh, uh, it, 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 I have my doubts, Skip. I, I, I think nothing will at this point. Uh, that, that's where I, that's where my writing has turned to um, um, more darker. Because um, if we haven't got it now, I don't think we're going to. So, for example, with the coronavirus. Uh, I've been writing for some time about there's the coronavirus, which is a biological fact, and there's also thing, also something riding on riding on its heels that, that's psychic, and you could call that a psychic virus. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, our own, if you look at the governing metaphors and the governing rhetoric addressing the virus, they're all military. It's a war zone. We're going to conquer this little bastard. We're going to overcome it. We're going to kill it. All military metaphors. Who's saying what Jung said towards the end of his life? Let's welcome the coming guest. Who's saying that? Right. And no, but, nobody. But, nobody in the public what, in in Jung's experience and time, uh, there were the two wars that obviously were military, but. Uh, he knew that he couldn't change the course of history and it took uh it took a lot of blood before people changed but they did change and so a lot of death and uh, you know i have the experience of going to japan at first when i was 15 years old so uh just 17 years after world war ii had ended and um, the Japanese were completely different people than they were during the war. There's no doubt about that, and still are. They haven't, they haven't gone back at all to where they were. I mean, they tried to, they they tried to revisit it through economics in the '80s, let's say, uh, when I was there doing business, and and the auto industry was trying to take over the world peacefully rather than non-peacefully, but even that got slammed back on them economically. And, and so they, 
they really did change in my view uh, both times I mean they, there it was it's been an editor editor approach but certainly that's true in Germany I mean um, you know there's nothing about Thomas Arse that would make me think of uh, the Germany of the 1930s and 40s, nothing at all. And I did a lot of business in Germany in uh, the 1980s, in the early 1980s. And I, uh, you know, the only, I mean, I did see some evidences of the war, but at the same time, um, you know, the Germans of 1984 were nothing like the Germans of 1944. So they were changed uh, and they thought they would win militarily. And maybe we think we can win this militarily. I agree with that, but I think it's, it's really not going to work that way. I mean, our president is still under the impression that we're going to have fewer than 68,000 deaths in the United States. And the statistics as they're being currently presented uh, don't indicate that at all. I mean, we're, we've been having uh, more than 2,000 deaths a day now. And so we're gonna blow past to 68,000 in about a month uh, or, or less than a month. And, uh, and it's uh, going to be quite a bit more terrible than people think. It is going to be an apocalypse, I think, and a psychic epidemic, a global psychic epidemic. Um, but, I mean, that's, do you think this will bring about the change uh, similar to the Second World War and First World War? Is that yeah, I think it will. But but that's just, I, I probably am alone in that position. But that I. I have that sense um, just because I have those experiences in Germany and yeah. Japan. Yeah, there's no doubt that people can be changed uh, by these dreadful experiences. And I have no doubt <clears throat> that uh, people will be changed by what we're going through now. But uh, uh, I think, I think it's the, what, I'm, what I'm addressing, <clears throat> what, what my books address and what I'm speaking about in relation to Jung and the Red Book is a change in consciousness not just a change in personal consciousness, but a change in consciousness, which leads to the world appearing a different way. Now, the, the best, um, the, the best historic, there are some historic ex examples. It doesn't happen very often. In fact, Heidegger points to five, five changes of that order where you might say that a change of consciousness happened to everybody <laughs> and, and the world appeared differently to everybody five times during the course of our written history anyway and, and uh, so the, <clears throat> the one that's easiest to point to is the industrial revolution and the collapse of the metaphysical world and, and the rise of nihilism so within a relatively short time the, indus the industrial revolution took off because there was a profound uh, collapse of uh, the metaphysical world in other words the hierarchical value system uh, uh, or, or, uh, uh, or there being a center to anything just disappeared. And we can get a sense of that through uh, the vehicles that we always get a sense of these things from, and that's our artists and uh, the mystics and the prophets and, and the, 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 uh, the novelists and so on, who were the, Sort of the canaries in the mine. <laughs> they 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 got onto it first, and and they are in despair. At the turn of the 20th century, um, you know, uh, what the hell happened? They, they picked it up. What the hell happened? You know, God is dead, as Nietzsche said. You know, he was the greatest mouthpiece of of, of the new world, but he un he understood, uh, and then others did too, uh, that something has just changed. There's no ver verticality to our existence anymore. Well, uh, I, but... I have been known to say that Jung found the living God where he lives and how he goes about doing the business of the Godhead. And, um, and so he actually was the, the um, answer to Nietzsche. Um, he, of course, Jung yeah. and I, 
Jungian analysts do, um, you know, talk about the the uh, industrial revolution and such a lot, but um, but the reality is that you know those evolved religions that we have, we actually need them. We have to go back to them, and I, I think that that's the fifth stage of consciousness. It's kind of posited by Murray Stein in his book. Um, about that BTS took up uh, about uh, Jung's map of the soul, uh, where he uh, he talks about three new stages of consciousness. One of them being to turn back and look at the at the organized religions as they are evolved ways of therapy, in effect, uh, which is what Jung said himself. And rather than try to invent a new religion, which would be like inventing an ar artificial arm, instead of cutting off, you know, you cut off your arm and, and replace it with an artificial arm, uh, you actually realize that you have an evolved arm that's there and, and uh, it's been ignored for, in various degrees for 500 years, but now we have to go back and relook at them and understand what those religions were telling us. I mean, that's my observation. That, 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 that's good. That's good hermeneutics. Yeah, you, you study the past in order to uh, uh, revivify your own life and, and to answer the important questions of our age. That's yeah. true. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. That's a, a good practice. Quick question. Quick question. Now, I haven't studied Nietzsche. But yes. when God is dead, is it could it be construed that Nietzsche was saying that truth is dead? Because uh, you know I could uh, go into quite a bit of uh, anecdotal experiences and observations and you know factual analysis by others that to, we are actually that we are very much in a in a, an illusion of self deception. There's a lot of things that we're doing and uh, have experienced uh, which have happened right in front of our eyes and uh, everybody thinks that they saw what they saw when they really didn't see what they saw yeah. so um and and uh, just to close on the thought before you can speak on it uh, there's a faith keeper there named Oren Lyons with the Haudenosaunee or uh, the Iroquois also known as Six Nations and their elders said that we need to have, and they're speaking as for humanity. They're they're always doing things for the people, not just the Donasone. He he says the elders' message is value change for survival. So in other words, we have to really change our values if we're going to survive. So anyway, God is dead. Maybe means God the uh, truth is dead. Any thoughts on that? Uh, that's certainly in line with what was happening in Europe at the time. You see, um, uh, Jung was born into a Europe uh, at the time, well, you know, his love for Nietzsche, um, but uh, he was born into that time when, when uh, you, can, you can read a lot about this, by the way, in Shambhasani's introduction in the Red Book uh, of the turmoil that Europe was in at the time. And it was called nihilism uh, because of this collapse of values, including truth, just collapsed. And, and so any perspective was as good as anybody else's. And don't you tell me that you're more true than I am, that sort of thing. <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's led to, uh, uh, well, it led to what we have now. But uh, uh, Europe was in an absolute turmoil and people did not know where to go, what to turn, where to turn, and the art, the early, the early art of the 20th century reflects that. But it, uh, that's, but that's another story. I've also got essays on that in my academia site. But uh, uh, to Skip's point, where Jung uh, rediscovered a supreme value for him was was within. He he went within. Uh, <clears throat> he, <clears throat> he wasn't. He wasn't. So in that, in that regard, he, he was very much a part of, of nihilism, and he knew it. Uh, he, he, he simply found God within, 
And uh, but I think more deeply than that, he, he's not interested in the distinction in the separation between within and without. Uh, uh, as you can see in his memories, dreams, and reflections, when he talks about living at the tower, you know, there's, there's no inside outside there. It's just He's it, describing that world that appeared to him when he was at Belt Bollingdon in, in that new, what I would call a new state of mind. So, so when I'm talking about um, changing as a result of the coronavirus, um, uh, I'm talking about a change of a magnitude uh, where the world appears differently to everyone. In the, in, in, out of the same magnitude as in the Industrial Revolution, they could only do that when nature lost its sacredness and just became a resource. Then it just exploded. Now, who, who did that? Nobody did that. That was, that, was, that was given to us from the psyche, the ground of our being. You know, the, the, sudden, the psyche apparently lost interest in these hierarchy of values and in, in nature being sacred. And so we, we were just the poor bunnies who received the, uh, the news and, and, and decided to serve our egos. We could have done something very different than that. Uh, that's, a, that's a big point that Steiner makes. We could have done something very different with our separate egos than what we're doing. Instead, instead uh, we decided, to, oh, well, nature's just a resource. Let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, Here but we now, now we have at the end of the 20th century and now in the beginning of the 21st that that materialism is now dead or you know um, rationalism is is now dead in a, in effect and it, because the coronavirus is paying no attention to to our materialism yes it's, it's, it's challenging all of that and the, the, there are people writing about that at this time mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Uh, but my second article that I that I was included that was included in Murray's and Thomas's uh, book on uh, the relevance to postmodernism, uh, I've tried to tease out through my own experiences uh, and Jung's and Nietzsche's what the new world is that wants to come in, and the virus definitely is a vehicle for that world, but the hardened ego is treating it as a threat. Jung treated it as a coming guest that must be welcomed. You know, his Philemon and Balkus story, that to welcome, to welcome the, the unbidden guest. We, uh, our materialistic ego is hardened so much collectively that we, anything alien coming in, is treated as a terror that has to be crushed. So we get the military rhetoric. Yeah. And as Skip said, the virus doesn't, doesn't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, coming, it's coming in anyway. Uh, so the situation is completely unpredictable uh, and chaotic at this time. We just don't know what's going to happen, even though mystics, modern mystics, are talking about the new world or they're talking about destruction. You get both sides. Yeah. And uh, I, I have a note of caution about all of that, trying to predict the future at this time. Um, and, and it comes from a story of the, uh, the Oglala Sioux at the turn of the 20th century, when they are on the edge of being genocidally wiped out. Right? So around that time, they had mystics and shamans, and, they, and one of them brought forward this vision uh, of uh, what the future holds for them. And it was uh, full of love, full of bounty. The, the grass will return, the buffalo will return. Uh, the white man will be rolled up like a carpet and sent back to where they belong. And, and we will be full of love for each other. And they, they, they had a dance around that called the spirit dance or the ghost dance. And they began to practice it uh, in, in the firm understanding uh, as told by the shaman's vision that this would happen. And of course they got wiped out. So that's yeah. a note of caution. It's because it comes about because we mistake prophecy for prediction. That's a big mistake. Right. Then you'll go down the wrong path. 
you know, Cindy, you were trying to get, uh, put in a word I thought at one point. Did you want to say something? I unmuted you. Yeah, um, I don't remember what my question was. It was probably answered, um, but I, um, I, I really appreciate your, your talk, John, and um, I, um, <clears throat> I had an experience long ago, and I was thinking as you were describing, um, gee, I don't recall if I was initiated, but I know I was in another world, and it was very dark and exhausting. But um, this, this is a very, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome, Cindy. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Nicole, um, where is Nicole? Is she gone? Yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah, hi. No, I'm here. Oh, wow. This has been, I've written five pages of notes. <laughs> I'm just keep getting uh, um, insights and, and sort of there's this uh, space that I'm moving closer to if that makes sense like in my creativity I guess and just myself um why did you mention black swans Skip? oh um black swan what was that? oh because um you know I went through <laughs> this business this business school that was 15 courses in statistics by different names and never ever did my statistics teachers ever suggest that we could have a crash like 2008 and uh, yeah. and so then I was at a at a meeting of the corporate advisory council of the university and my professor of 35 years um, was there and I wanted to challenge him I said why didn't you ever mention this possibility and he says, oh, that's just a black swan. And they don't exist. Okay, so they call it a black swan. Okay, there's actually there's an actually a economics book called The Black Swan. And so then I was in Hawaii visiting Joss one time, actually, uh, with Debbie. And uh, we actually saw a black swan. Or not one, we saw a whole flock of them. And so I took a picture right. and I, I immediately sent it by my iPhone to the dean of the university or the business school and <laughs> said black swans exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, it's, it's sort of a bugaboo of mine because I, I'm, uh, I, I'm so angry with my business school for failing to teach about the black swan. And I don't, I, to this day, I don't know if they're teaching it now or they're, they're just in this hunky dory. Um, everything is an average type of thing, or a, or a mean, and uh, so that's okay. all you have to worry about, right? That's the statistical approach, and they 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 literally have written um, human behavior out of the business school. Okay, this is Milton Friedman and the Chicago School. It's all. It's basically a psychotic way of looking at the world, um, and you know that's mm, a, that, that's that's a two or three hour conversation. Just to and, add something on this one. Yeah, please go ahead, Kushbu. So, um, so, so I think it, I, I learned this uh, day before only by one of the contemporary mythologists of India for now, like right now. Um, so, so we have like four primary goddesses and, uh, in which one is a goddess of knowledge and, uh, and I've been like, she have particular mandala and I have been wanting to draw it. I, I shared it uh, earlier as well. Her, like every, all gods in India normally have like an animal uh, symbol to them or, or a, accompanying animal. So the, the goddess of knowledge or literacy or education is called Saraswati. Now her uh, animal is a swan. And oh, wow. uh, 
yeah yeah and why uh, they say that uh, it's her uh, her animal is because if you give that animal a ball mix uh, mix of water and milk it will only drink milk it knows what to eliminate consciously and so it yeah wow. yeah so i so that is why it it accompanies the knowledgeable the feminine energy which is like knowledge knowledgeable with this with, for an example uh, the traditional dancer wear the 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 what do they wear in uh, ank anklets in in their foot with a lot of um, ankle bells. bracelets yeah ankle, ankle yeah, bracelets yeah 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 with mm -hmm. with lot of lot of bells yeah. so so they call it they call it saraswati saraswati so that dancer call their uh, uh, ankle bracelet kind of a thing um call it saraswati like a, the the goddess so so there is a very very beautiful association uh, here which 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 you guys uh, were talking came up and the black swan also is is the part of that story which i i am not fully aware of and i will get back uh, to this group about it <laughs> yeah awesome yeah. <laughs> i mean I, yeah 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 is it, what a, what what comes to mind is john um this is great by the way <laughs> and there's 12 of us i don't know why that's significant but i like it i like the number <laughs> so how is if this virus is a vehicle for this shift and that the way that we're being dealing with it and 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 sort of you know is very um warlike could you speak into what you meant by how we approach it or what what do we what are you suggesting um, <clears throat> I'm suggesting that the uh, the way we're approaching it now as a military conquest will be and have one outcome that's our undoing uh -huh. already, uh -huh. already you can see the ripple effect to the financial world, the economic world, the political world. It's all, it's all coming apart. And, uh, yep. and, 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 and our response is to tighten up and, and to uh, con try to control it. So uh, I suppose you have to uh, have some sort of uh, sense that there are indeed powers greater than the human being in the universe. And here we are sort mm -hmm. of waving our sticks at it saying we will control this and you know ask the dinosaurs <laughs> yeah. yeah right you know, we, yeah. we just we we just don't believe in the, in the modern the modern mind and its cartesian consciousness we just don't believe that there's anything outside bigger than the ego as the as the agent of, of its own destiny we just don't believe it that's why it's going to be rough so like a softer approach. Uh, if one can, uh, a softer approach simply would mean uh, to, to be more improvisational in your life and to be a little more humble uh, and uh, to, to synchronize with what's happening, uh, being ready to let go of what's, what we have to let go of. And um, uh, Collectively, we're just not doing that. I mean, people are getting enraged over toilet paper, for God's sake. You know, I mean, that, that's how far we've sunk to this clinging, grasping mode of being. And uh, people are ready to kill each other over that. And so that's where I don't, I don't hold any illusions about what, what's gonna, where we're going. Uh, but for individuals, um, I can't do any better than to, to take uh, than to take old man's old man Jung's wisdom towards the end of his life when he wrote to uh, uh, the uh, his friend I can't remember his name it'll come but he that in one of his letters he wrote uh, the role of the artist is to welcome the coming guest 
So uh, when, when some when something when something approaches us that's alien in character that that uh, we can't control, we could welcome it into our lives in the sen- in the sense that we open up to what it wants to say to us, what it, what it wants to say to us, and. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, and be prepared. Be prepared to be provisional, to be uncertain, to be to deal with unpredictability, to deal with chaos, to learn how to navigate that. You now, a lot of my books and essays are, are about developing an appropriate cultural practice to our times, which is chaos. How do you, how do you how do you how do you navigate chaos? Well, that's what I that's what I've been spending a lot of time with. Well, you can't do it with certainty. You can't do it with hardened categories of thought. You know, you, you get a new experience and you try to assimilate it to what you know. It doesn't work. Chaos, yeah. chaos breaks that down. So you need, a, you need another way. So, so it works to the very heart of language. Are, are you going to use pragmatic informational type language? Or are you, are you going to use language that's softer? Has, uh, has more uncertainty on it, more ambiguity, like poetry, <laughs> poetic language. I don't, I don't mean literal poetry. Not everyone's a literal poet with their craft, but but, but we can be poetic in our language in the sense that we can we can be open-ended, uncertain, uh, not not con- not so concerned about categories as a way of thinking, but more but more as perhaps valorizing movement. And you know, this is what some of the great poets like Wallace Stevens were doing. You know, they, they were trying to, or E.E. E. Cummings, you know, they were trying to uh, develop languages more synchronizing with this chaos that we're in. That we can do. Well, we can look for the symbol, can't we, John? In other words, the, there is going to be a sub- symbolic ending to this at some point. I don't, I'm not saying that's going to be soon, but some symbol will emerge. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that's, a, that's an aspiration that's better than some, Skip. And, and, and in the meantime, uh, what we can do immediately is open ourselves to the uncertainty that dreams bring. So instead of, instead of interpreting a dream back to what you already know about and saying, well, that's the end of that, dreams are, dreams are expressions of the unknown future. Uh, if you think about a dream, uh, they always come with some familiarity, right? So in other words, that's the past. Anything, anything familiar in the dream has, is, is an image of the past. But always, the psyche rearranges them in a fresh way. And that's new. Yeah. You cannot assimilate that new arrangement to anything in the past. Or you can, but you'll, then you'll destroy the psyche. So good luck to you if you want to do that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. if, you, if you stay, if you, oh, I'm if sorry. You stay, sorry. Yeah, no, Cindy, go ahead. Yeah. The rearrangement is that the part of the dream that doesn't quite make sense? I mean. Yes, it is. It is. That's exactly right. It's new. Yeah. So that's coming from the unborn future. That's the unborn future right there. And so how you relate to this new arrangement of the familiar is critical to how you're going to navigate this time of chaos. Are you going to open yourself up to uncertainty? Are you going to let the dream sort of penetrate your being and, 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 uh, and push you into uh, uncertainty and not knowing, and as Skip said, the uh, breakdown in rationality? Are you going to allow that to happen and maybe uh, even come out with uh, some poetic speech or, or an art form or so, some expression of that uncertainty that's not governed by your rational mind? That we can do right now. And that helps us uh, enter a state that's, that synchronizes with the chaos we're in whenever, while we wait for the transcendent symbol. It, we, we need to give uh, some others an opportunity, and I especially want to hear from the artist in our presence here <laughs> and my colleague on this effort. But um, uh, Nancy, do you have any comments about what you've been hearing or any questions that you'd like to ask? Well, I'm very, I've enjoyed this very much, and uh, especially this 
different approach from a military approach to this kind of surfboarding approach, surfing the wave approach. Um, but I, I was wondering earlier, you said what happens to us when we have a shift in consciousness. You've worked with a lot of people over a lifetime. Uh, can you give us any ideas when we have a big shift in consciousness, how to approach it, how to, how to uh, allow it, uh, what to do with the strange experiences that come up that are totally new and, and um, we, we don't even really understand what's happening. We might even experience the eternal and, and, the, and the present at the same time. Uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I'm sure I also want to hear from the artists in the group too, but so let me lead into it by saying what you can do immediately, Nancy, is, is express, express that confusion or that uncertainty or, or, or that uh, uh, irrationality, if you want to use that word, to ex begin to express it in some artistic form without trying to understand it at all. Just let it come out. So if you're impacted by a dream that turns you inside out and upside down, try and, you know, try and give some form to that artistically. You know, I, I used to teach art in this way to uh, people in workshops. And, and the first thing I'd do is get them, they had a sheet of paper with uh, crayons and so on. I'd get them to tear up the paper and crumple it up and, and give it a new shape. Um, uh, and then break up the crayons and crush them and give them a new shape and then use use the non-dominant hand to do something. So any, anything to break up the ego. <laughs> I was desperate. <laughs> give, give, give them a, uh, an experience of, of some, some part of their being speaking that they're not used to. So, uh, or even using a, putting a crayon between their toes so that, that, that brings you closer to that place of uncertainty and, and uh, unknowingness that's required to bring in the, the unborn future. We have to be in that space. Thank you. Uh, right, so um, let's see. Oh, Joss, do you have some comments here or questions? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, John. It was really, really very interesting. Um, I, yeah, it's, uh, um, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. In fact, um, you know, uh, earlier on when uh, Skip started this COVID-19 check-in um, and I was invited, uh, I, uh, boldly said that this virus was the love virus. Um, and I wasn't sure if people were ready for that paradigm shift, so to speak, in that um, um, different perspective of seeing the virus uh, on uh, uh, taking on, on a positive spin. But um, I, um, I see that maybe this this time that we're going through is maybe a time where there may be um, a large emergence of spiritual awakening, uh, uh, like you mentioned, a paradigm shift. Before it was one, one here, one there, and you know, Jung went through his, the way you described what he was going through with um, all these um, images and visual um, um, uh, images that were coming into his reality it made me think of um what what some psychiatrists or more of the nouveau psychiatrists who are more into this more spirituality called like spiritual awakening or spiritual emergency and what happens in that is uh it's um blending or trying to um uh, put together the consciousness and the unconscious um, and merge it together. And in that fight for, uh, from duality thinking to oneness thinking, we get kind of chaotic 
and confused. And then there's just a lot of um, um, common, uh, discombobulation of the, the psyche, the mind. But I think the, the bottom line is uh, this whole coronavirus or any kind of major disaster is a call to love. And we are, um, it, there's a saying by uh, Cahil Gibran, how shall my heart be unsealed unless it's broken? And right now we are all being broken down um, in order to tame our ego as Jung would call it. So we're kind of all perhaps um, slowly emerging to this awakening because of this coronavirus. So the vir virus is an opportunity for us to make a choice, a choice in a, a directional choice, whether um, we want to go into the negative militaristic view or embrace the all and see that the coronavirus is part of the all. And we somehow as a collective unconsciousness created all this chaos and how do we harness love into uh, finally coming to a balance. And um, so anyway, that's basically it. Part of it is I think, you know, as we as individuals go through our individuation and, and try to make um, ourselves meaningful, we ask our question, you know, what is, my, <clears throat> what is my character? Well then, what is the character of all the human race? And um, Aristotle once said, character, is that which reveals moral purpose, exposing the kind of things a man chooses or avoids. So in this time and era, how do we choose? What do we choose? What do we value? And that's going to set our direction as part of the human race, part of the all. That's it. So um, Joss is our duty psychiatrist, by the way. And uh, Kaylee, do you have any questions or did we just lose her? Oh, yeah. I think she did have a question. I think she did have a question there, uh, Skip, at one point. She's... Oh, no, Cindy, you had a question, I think. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think I, I asked it and I just, again, want to say thank you. I'm very interested and I'm going to get that book. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out what the initiation is, but we'll move forward. <laughs> yeah. Tim, Tim or, uh, Mirz usually doesn't want to say anything, so I'm, I'm not going to call on her unless she raises her hand. Uh, but um, but uh, Tim, do you want to say something? Yeah, just on the, on the tail of what Josh just said, here's, this is a, an opportunity for us all to be broken open. Uh, it's, it is going to break us in different ways. And there's probably not a one of us who is, who is going to be uh, safe from this catastrophe. Um, and hopefully we can use the opportunity to, to be broken open. I put a poem on the chat from J John Jackson, who's another Jungian analyst from California, which is, I think, a, a wonderful perspective. It's a, it's, a, it's a message from the virus saying, you know, yeah, I'm a part of nature too, and, and I'm, I'm being ignored and, and vilified in this process. So it's, it's kind of an interesting perspective from the, the, uh, the attitude that, that you were talking about, John. Of of yeah. welcoming the the opportunity. Um, one of the things I wanted to share was a. Uh, can Can you let me share something, Skip? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I did a drawing, I think last week. Should that, be okay uh, now. Can, I can hear. Okay. It. This is this is called the. The narrow path, and it's a it's a drawing I did maybe a week ago. That uh, that talks of, that addresses my own feeling of of trepidation and 
you know, we can we can get through this. We can we have the tools we need to proceed, but it's going to be it's going to require a lot of attention and care and communication with each other. Um, it is not an impossible journey, and and this this kind of image. <laughs> both expresses my fear and my hope at the same time. Is there a, is there a white color dot in the painting down, downwards? There's a, is there? It is intentional. A what? Uh, there is a, 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 under the bridge, there's a white color uh, dot. Under the Big dot. Towards Not, the bottom of the, oh, of the down here. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. Yeah. That's just, that's just the edge of the drawing. But there is up here. You can see this little spot that could be a standing figure. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh. Awesome. I love that. Yeah, and and I feel it like a, a lot, a big part of me is resonating with it. And I think that will be the proper way of expressing Oh, good. It. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's, um, it reminds me of the monk's moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Actually, I saw, um, if I can make a comment about it, I was watching um, a children's program today, and it had inside this building all these uh, types of, and it looked just like your mountain peaks, um, and because it created so much surf, uh, surface area for the uh, electromagnetic field to give... Um, the military's um, uh, communication system security. And so it, it was funny seeing that earlier. I was a, one of the first things I thought of. And then I thought of that picture that um, we've probably all seen where all the stairs are going all different ways and they all join up at the same time. And you can yeah, look the at MC that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Oh, but there's the picture of the stairs joining. Oh, yes. There's a hedge. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's my family. That's our, that was our family puzzle that we, I've done it a few times. Yeah. So, so Tim, when you were saying uh, it was your fear and your hope, when I thought of all the surface area on those peaks based on what I heard on TV earlier, it, it made me think of that this was going to give you a lot of hope. It, it made you think, say it again. Um, when I looked at your, your sketch of the, the peaks because of all the superficial surface area, it would give an abundance of hope, just like what I saw on TV with the same type of um, uh, um, um, surface. Well, I, I'm not describing it right, but it, it, it's an analogous to like inside a sound studio. It would help absorb all the electromagnetic fields with all the surface area. And so oh, sure. it was a lot of, a lot of absorption and when I looked at your sketch I thought oh it's a lot of sucking up the hope <laughs> oh wow well that's a I hadn't thought of that but that's a really that's a great interpretation <laughs> so John I wanted to just really thank you for this whole um, this whole presentation it's been really fascinating for me and I'm thank you John. I, I did read your uh, your article about the virus, but I haven't read the article in the Red Book for our time. I'm looking forward to that. 
right. You you'll find it on my on my academia website. Yeah, the academia website. Uh, Acad the same one your paper was on. Yeah, yeah. it's on there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I gave him the link, and he joined Academia, oh, so he's <coughs> now a member, so he can get what he wants. So. <laughs> is, that, is the link the one that you just put on the chat? That, that's the link to the to poem. To the Academia site. No, that's the link to the John Jackson's poem from the point of view of the coronavirus. You can, you can go to academia.edu, is that right? I think that's the one. And just do a search and you can get John's uh, uh, publications there. So, so um, we have a bit of a tradition that's started up in this group to uh, close out our sessions uh, by going to Kushbu, who offers us a, uh, a Hindu mantra that at least for me, uh, has been extremely moving, and I haven't heard anybody object. So uh, if you have objections, uh, please let me know. But until I hear objections, <laughs> I'm going to come to Pushbu. Well, first of all, I'd like to just thank John for coming on and, and Definitely. doing We're this. Definitely. We're all very happy to have had you here today and it's been well, thank very you valuable much. thank you and uh, and also uh, i think that uh you know we also were uh, kind of memorializing thomas arts and his contribution and inviting <clears throat> john to do that first article and uh, and i also noticed that uh, mary stein uh, save John's essay until the last on purpose. And because if you go to Young's Red Book, the very last page, there's a one uh, phrase in German that he wrote in 1959, his last entry into the Red Book, and it said, Muglichkeit. It is finished, huh? And it means possibilities. Oh. And wow, wow, I love that possibilities in the future. And I just thought that was so uh, appropriate that uh, to recognize John that way and that he knows that the, the work that John is doing and that John does recognize these possibilities. And I encourage people uh, to take a look at uh, his, uh, he's got a whole collection as <laughs> I've read. Uh, you know, I'm still reading as John, so. <laughs> And oh, thank he's, you, yeah. yeah. I thank put you. a link in the chat for that for that article on the. Oh, thank there. you, thank you, thank you, Tim, and thank you, John, and let's uh, and, yeah. and Kushfu, if uh, we'll go with uh, closing. Thank yeah. you. And everybody, well, thank you, thank you very much, John. We really appreciate it. Hey, well, it's, good, it's good to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Everybody, take a deep breath before Kushfu again. <laughs> And then exhale. So we are uh, praying for happiness and well-being for all the people of the world and happiness and well-being of all the worlds that exist. Um, Ah, uh, Loka Samasa Sukhino Namaste Loka
Thank you so much, Kushbu. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, okay. Joss, please uh, thank Kaylee for being with us. I hope hope we didn't scare her away. <laughs> <laughs> Just when I was going to call on her, but anyway, we'll we'll be back on tomorrow at eleven a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, Mara, do you want to be featured? Joss, anybody else want to be featured? Would you like to be featured, Coach Wu? <laughs> I am, you can use me the way you want. I'm all yours. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> okay, you're on. You're on. Tell, us <laughs> your, tell us your story tomorrow. You have an interesting story that we only got a, li a limited bit of yesterday, and I think we'd all like to hear it more fully. Are, are you willing? Kushbu? Sure, sure. Yeah. This is the family, yeah. Okay, that would be true. For me, it's tonight. For me, it's tonight. I, yes, it's tonight. <laughs> Kush was the yeah. <laughs> only only one on this chat that uh, is has to do it twice planet. A, twice planet. in one day <laughs> on, the, on this planet that has to do it twice on Sunday. <laughs> well, you yeah. have all day to plan, Kush. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, Tim, bye yeah. bye everybody. Bye bye. Oh, bye. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Peace. Take care. Bye. Bye.